prodigal son. I have experienced every part of a separation from the father that this young man did. Uh, William Robertson Nickel wrote the Expositor's Bible Commentary in 1889. He called this parable of the prodigal son uh, the crown and flower of all parables. I like that. And I've heard this, I'll, I'll just, I want to give a disclaimer as we're starting out. I've heard this passage preached from two different angles before. I've heard it preached from the standpoint of the lost person coming to Christ. I can certainly see that, amen. I have heard it preached from the backslider, the wayward child, coming back into fellowship with the Father. And I'm sure you've heard it both ways too. But no matter what, either way, this account tells us of the love of our Heavenly Father and love of a father and his willingness to forgive when his children fall. I'm so glad that we have a father that's willing to forgive us when we fall, amen? Because if it were not for him, we would be in bad shape if, if we didn't have a father that was willing to forgive us. And we, we talk about a parable, and all a parable is is a simple story that Jesus used to illustrate uh, moral and spiritual lessons to those he was teaching. And that word prodigal doesn't even show up in the Bible anywhere, uh, it, but it means to be wasteful, to be extravagant, to be reckless. And many would hear the word and define it as being wayward, but it refers to someone who is extremely wasteful. Now stop and think about that. Each and every one of us, when we're born, if you go out in a cemetery and you look at a headstone, it's got a date on it, don't it? And then it's got an ending date if that person's already passed on, a birth date and a death date. And there's that dash right in the middle in there. And that when you're born, uh, the Lord has given you a life to live. And, and so many of us waste that life that we're given instead of realizing who is the giver of that life and that we need to serve him uh, throughout our days here on this earth. Here in this passage, we've got a son. He's a younger son. He's more, re he's more than ready to start feeling his oats. He's ready to get out there and experience the world. And he's not about to put his time of fun off any longer. So as we get, I got six points. I'm hoping to move on through here uh, and cover all of it. I hope we can get through all of it tonight. But the first thing I want to look at tonight is the rebellion of a son. The rebellion of a son. Look in verse 11 and 12. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living I tell you, the younger son was pretty brash, wasn't he? That younger son went to his father and demanded his inheritance in full right then, right there. If that's not the epitome of pride, I don't know what is. Amen? And the father obliged, you see here. It says, and he, he divided unto them his living there in verse 12. Now, I say it was to be safe to say this son had a few things going against him. Number one... He had a rebellious spirit, amen? And can I tell you, that's kind of where we begin at with a rebellious spirit. And he had, he had a problem with the authority God had placed over him in the form of his father. He had a respectless spirit. He had a basic problem with his father just not respecting him as his dad. And I'll tell you what, we live in the age of technology, don't we? How many of you got computers? I know Brother Ralph does because he's always talking about how you can't get it to cooperate and everything but, but I can think back when I was young when I was a teenager especially I was a rebellious teenager and we live in the age of computers sometimes in computers uh, especially if you got a windows machine you get the blue screen of death on there you're not going any farther unless you uh, what's called a hard reboot on that computer and I tell you what, if I'd have acted the way this young man did toward his father, my daddy would have given me a hard reboot along the way, amen? And should give me a hard reboot. He was rebellious. He was respectless. Now, if you look in the history, the, some of the manners and customs back then, an inheritance usually was given a, when either the father couldn't manage his estate any longer or he had died. That was the usual custom back then. But we see here the father gave in and he granted the younger son his wish. And can I submit to you tonight, rebellion always begins with a seed or an idea that's been planted into the head of somebody. Amen? 
Somewhere along the way, this younger son became unsatisfied with home and what home had provided for him. He felt restrained by home and was attracted to the world. Look at the boldness. He said, Father, give me. Like his dad hadn't worked all of his life for, uh, like it was just nothing to him. Just give it to me now. I want it. So we see a son that was in rebellion right there. He was full of greed. He was full of selfishness. But the second thing I want us to see is in verse 13. I want to see not only the rebellion of a son, but the run from reality. When he made those demands of his daddy, he had lost all sense of reality, hadn't he? He had become detached with the way the world operated, with the way the family system was set up, and and the authority that had been placed over him in the form of his father. And I want to tell you something. Home is always the safest place to be, amen? Home, when you're a child, when you're home, it should be the safest place on earth for you. That should be where you feel the most comfortable. You can be the, yourself. You're, you're with your family. And, and it should be the safest place. And spiritually, home is always the best place to be. Amen. We see some realities here in this relationship in verse 13. He said, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. First reality, the father and son relationship was broken right then and there, wasn't it? His relationship with his father was not what it should be, not what God had intended for it to be. The second reality, he was young. He wasn't ready to make those decisions on his own. His body might have been, but his brain wasn't. And isn't that like us too many times? We get ahead of God or we get out of the will of God. We get out of sorts with God and we think we know more than God does. And we think we're ready for certain things, but God says, "Uh uh-uh, you're not ready. So we also had a, a third reality that no matter where you run, you can't hide from God. Notice in this passage here, he said he, he gathered everything together. He took his journey where? Into the far country. Wonder why it was the far country. Well, I can think real easy. Far country, I'm much less likely somebody's going to see me, amen? I can live the way I want to when I know nobody sees me and, and nobody's looking at me. I can do more things. I can get away with more things. But you know, no matter where you run, you can't hide from God. He's always watching you, isn't he? Ask Jonah about that. You know, Jonah got the command to preach to Nineveh. But he fled in the opposite direction to Tarshish. To escape that task of proclaiming God's message to the great heathen city. He got arrested by a storm and at his own request was hurled into the sea. He was swallowed up by the, in the belly of the whale. And I do believe it's a literal whale, don't you? <laughs> Remaining alive in the belly of the whale for three days. Then the whale got tired of him and puked him up. But you know what? After all that, Jonah got, he saw things a little bit different, didn't he? Jonah saw things. He obeyed then after the second call to go do what he was commanded to do. No matter where you run, you can't hide from God. The far country even isn't even far enough away from God. God knows where you're at. God sees where you're at. He sees what you're doing. He sees, he knows what you're thinking. The fourth reality, the sin always leads to waste. That verse 13 said, after he took his journey into the far country, there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And sin always leads to waste, my friends. A waste of resources, a waste of time, a waste of talent, a waste of relationships, a waste of your testimony, a waste of reputation, a waste of character. It does nothing but waste your life, sin does. He blew everything his father had given him on riotous partying and living. So we see the rebellion of a son. We see the the run from reality. But the third thing I want us to look at tonight 
is the ravaging effect of sin. You can't go over here and dabble in sin that it doesn't cost you something at some point. You can't go over here and one foot in a church house, one foot in the world, dabbling in the things of this world, the things of, of sin, and it not cost something. In verse 14, it says that when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. When I read that verse, I think about, I don't even know if the TV shows are still on or not, but these people that hit the lottery. How many times have you seen these people that they hit the millions in the lottery, and in a short amount of time, they're penniless. They don't have a thing to show for it. And, and they're in worse shape afterwards than they were beforehand. Sin in and of itself will leave you broke. It'll leave you broke financially. It'll leave you broke spiritually. Amen. And it said he has spent all, everything that the father had worked all of his life to accumulate, everything that he had just given to his son uh, when his son demanded it, he spent it all. It's a picture of moral and spiritual bankruptcy that you see when he says he spent it all and it left him broke. Sin will leave you hungry. Look at this. It says, after he spent everything, after he lived it up and parted and carried on, the unexpected happened, didn't it? At least in his eyes. There came a famine, a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Sin will leave you physically hungry. It will leave you spiritually hungry. If you know, if you're a child of God and you get away from God, God will begin to chasten you. And that chastening hand will be upon you until you repent and until you return to the safety of that relationship with Him. And you'll become spiritually hungry. You'll be hungry. You'll be destitute. You'll be broke. But yet deep down inside of you, you know where you're at. You know you're in the wrong place. You know where you need to go to. Sin will leave you hungry. That mighty famine. He not only was hungry for food, that young man at that point was starving for God, amen. He was starving for the relationship that he formerly had with his family. Sin will leave you destitute, and by that I mean in want. It says, during that famine, he began to be in want. All of a sudden, you know, you, you can live it up away from God for a period of time. Then there comes a payday. There comes a payday. Something will happen in your life that you did not expect. And it will leave you destitute because not only do you not have enough for the needs, you don't have enough now for what else has come up your way. You start to worry. And that's what this young man, I could just imagine, he's getting fidgety. He's starting to say, what in the world have I done? Is this the best decision I've made in my life? No. So sin has a ravaging effect. Sin will make you do things that you wouldn't normally do. It will, you know, look at, in verse 15, look at what he did during this famine. It says as he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. You know, that far country he went to, it's where he wasn't a citizen of. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now, I know Brother Billy wouldn't. I know Brother Ralph wouldn't. I'd say Larry wouldn't. I wouldn't. Brother Charlie wouldn't. Brother Carl probably wouldn't. Slopping hogs, we used to that. If you grew up on a farm. That's what he was doing, slopping hogs. But that was beneath him. That was beneath them. Over in verse 30, the brother, that we'll get to in a little bit, accused him of uh, devouring his living with harlots. Sin will make us do things that we wouldn't normally do. When we take our eyes off God and we put our eyes on the immediate, we put our eyes on the things of this world. You know what? I, I like stuff as well as anybody does. But when I die, all that stuff's left for somebody else to deal with. I've talked, my parents are up in years, and they've talked about 
moving and getting a smaller place. Dad still got tractors and stuff. And, and when he had the farm, he's been sentimental. He's held on to them because two of them was his daddy's that he bought. And he doesn't want to get rid of them. The other third one was one that dad bought. And, you know, he just, he, he, he's living in the past with that. It's sentimental. He thinks of his dad. He thinks of his days that he farmed. I said, Dad, it's just stuff. One day he said, son, I thought maybe you might want this. Bless his heart. I said, Dad, I live in a subdivision. I don't, I don't need three tractors. <laughs> now, I said that to say this. Sometimes we can get too wrapped up in the stuff. Sometimes we get too wrapped up in just the, 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 the trappings of the world that we live in, and it's easy to do. You know, in verse 16, normally this young man would have been glad to eat the same food as the hogs. And he says, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. But notice that last phrase. Yeah. No man gave unto him. Yeah. When, you, when you spin the wheel of roulettes, so to speak, here in this world, you got there and you decide, I'm going to be friends with this world and at enmity with God. Don't be surprised when you hit on hard times and, and then all of a sudden, the, you, you know, this friendship of the world that you thought you had, you find out they're not your friend to begin with. This world will never be your friend. It will never care about you. But my, my friends, Jesus cares about us. He wants us in that close relationship with him. He wants to provide for our needs. He wants to teach us and, and, to, uh, and to grow us spiritually. The old phrase says sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and count, cost you more than you want to pay. How many's heard that? That's, that's been around forever, and it's true. Your heavenly Father will allow us to step out of his will, but there's a cost associated with being out of the will of God. Over in Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 6. Actually, verse 3 through 6, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds, yet ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. Listen to this. My son, despise not thou the chastening hand of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. It goes on down in verse 11. Well, verse 8. Well, let me back up. Verse 7, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. You go on down here, and verse 11 says, Now no chastening, for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them, which are exercised thereby. I read all that for this. A child of God who is out of the will of God and is in direct rebellion with God, you will experience chastening. You will experience chastening. It is when you don't experience chastening that you really need to worry. Because if you say you're a Christian... But you get out into this world and you're living like the world and you're acting like the world, you're walking like the world, you're talking like the world, but you don't feel any correcting hand of God. There's a need to worry there. And can I say this? I pray it's not the problem with our church, but I know many churches do. I think a lot of our mission fields inside our church houses these days. People might have professed a head knowledge, but they don't have a heart knowledge. They've never had that heart transplant. And sin will cost you far more than you want to go. You know what? I don't want to make God out to be the heavy here, but he will be if he has to be. More times than not in my life, 
I've been chasing more heavily, but more times than not, I felt that gentle drawing pulling me back, convicting me, convicting me, saying, Tom, you're not, you're not where you're supposed to be with me. You're my child. You're not acting like my child. And experience loving on you, drawing you back in, pulling you back in. There's no better feeling in the world than when he pulls you in to his love and his correcting hand in that manner. So we've seen the ravaging effect of sin there. Let me get back to my text here. No man gave unto him. Don't, don't count on this world to provide for you. Don't count on this world to be friends with you. I tell you what, a lot of people is putting all their coins in the wrong piggy bank right now with everything that's going on in this world. You know, they're staking their reputation, staking their values and everything on, on, on this matter or that matter or whatever. The only thing that matters is your relationship with God. Amen. And what do you intend? You know, as I said in an earlier message, you can't fix a social, uh, a social pro, a spiritual problem with a social fix. You can't do it. The next thing I want us to see, though, is the repentance of the son. Verse 17 says, when he came to himself. I like that. I like that phrasing right there. When he came to himself. You know, we get it backwards a lot of times. We get full of ourselves and then God has to bring us to a point, usually through our own actions, where we come to ourselves and come to our senses. We call that hitting rock bottom. I call that tough love. He got out there, and he, he ran through his money. He ran out of food, didn't have any money to buy food. He tried to make friends. He got him a menial job slopping hogs, tried to make friends in the far country that he was in, but they weren't his friends. They didn't care about him. He got a little tough love. You know, we live in a pretty soft society nowadays. You get on, a, you get on a, especially a young person, you get on a young person, You've scarred them for life. Like I said back in the beginning of the message, I acted the way I acted. Daddy gave me a hard reboot. With a boot. I'm still living to tell about it. I'm not scarred for life, even though back then I thought I might have been. But when you reach the point of having to come to yourself, there's a pretty good chance you really haven't been yourself all along. Amen. We realize what we left behind when we rebelled. In verse 17 there it says, When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He didn't have it so bad to begin with, did he? And when it comes to our relationship with God, maybe we think he's not being fair with us. Well, God's not really not fair, he's just. We try to make God out to be something that he isn't. He's holy, he's just, he is a God of love. But over here, he is just. Home just got attractive once again when he said, how many of my hard servants, how many hard servants of my fathers have bread to eat? And to spare. He's looking at it opposite of his rebellion now. It's beginning to sink in. He said, Home is where safety is, like I said a while ago. Home is where your provision is, where your love is, where unconditional acceptance is. Home is where the Father is, and home is where forgiveness is. Amen? The answer when you're away from God is not to go further away from God. It's to come back to God. Some people say, I don't know where God's at in my life. He's right where you left him at. He didn't budge. You did. When we come to ourselves in that moment, God gives us a clear picture of our condition and just where we are and just what we must do. And it's a word that don't get preached much today. It's called repentance. Yes. What we have to do to make things right. I'm not talking about works here. I'm talking about going back and restoring a relationship with the Father. While I'm there, I might just park a little bit. I have a big problem. 
with two words in the English language or phrase, I'm sorry. I don't see I'm sorry in the Bible. Because I can tell you I'm sorry and not mean it. I can tell you I'm sorry and not acknowledge that I was ever wrong to begin with. I can tell you I'm sorry, pardon, just to get you to be quiet. How many's ever experienced that from somebody? They tell you they're sorry, but they don't mean it. But there's something different when you walk up. Brother Charles, I pick on you a lot, don't I? No. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? There's a big difference between that and I'm sorry with nothing else being said, isn't there? You know, and we do that because we, we re, we're pride again. We don't want to admit that we were ever wrong about something, even us Christians. Look at verse 18. We begin to see what repentance really is. He said, I will arise and go to my father. Listen to that. And will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before thee. Yes, repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of direction. But it is also a realizing and admitting of the sin that really did take place. It's not Repentance won't let you gloss over something. It requires you to deal with it head on. Eye to eye. God knows we sin. But did you know he wants us to know we sin? That's why repentance is there. God knows we sin. He, he's, he's, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. But sometimes we sweep, squeak by and think we'll squeak by here. and well, Nobody will know this. But yet there's always somebody that we've offended, somebody that we've wronged, and God's looking down on it all. And repentance forces us to come to grips with the reality of our sin. Notice after he realized that he needed to repent, it got, he got humble all of a sudden. He said, I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I'm going to make something clear. If you're here and you don't know Christ today, even if you are here, you do know Christ. I'm thankful for his grace and mercy. And the only thing that you or I contributed to our own salvation was the sin that it took to make it necessary to begin with. You hear what I'm saying? He got humble. He got contrite. And notice he said the direction of repentance here. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I could wrong Miss Janet right here. And I did wrong against her. But the ultimate wrong is against God. It doesn't matter who it is that you wrong, that you sin against. The ultimate sin is against an almighty God. So he noticed that need of repenting. And unfortunately, some never get to the next step. That chastening hand of God will continue until such time as the child of God repents and returns. And yes, I said a while ago I didn't want to make God out to be the heavy, but sometimes the only option left is for God to take us a saint home when they're in such deep rebellion and will not respond to that chastening hand of God. So, he said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. No more worthy to be called thy son. But notice something interesting here. Back in verse 12, when he went to his father, he said, Father, give me. Notice here in verse 19. This is part of his prayer that started in verse 18. Basically, he said, Father, make me as one of thy hired servants. He was looking for restoration there. Next thing I want to see is the restoration and the rejoicing in verses 20 through 24. 
The son followed through with his repentance. says, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I can say with certainty, folks, I'm not worthy to be called a child of God. I can say with certainty, none of us here are worthy to be called a child of God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ties into what I said just a moment ago. The only thing that we contributed to our salvation was the sin that made it necessary. I love, you all know, I love Wearsby. I quote Wearsby. No matter what some preachers and singers claim, Wearsby said, we are not saved by God's love. God loves the whole world and the whole world doesn't get saved. We are saved by God's grace and grace is love that paid a price. Our Lord gave his life on Calvary's cross. He shed his innocent blood, became sin for you and I, so that the debt could be paid that we couldn't pay ourselves. But we see here, in, in, uh, he said, uh, so the father had compassion, ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. Can I tell you, if you're, if you're wayward with God right now, he's waiting for you to come home to him. If you're lost, let me, let me break this down. I said at the start of our message, I've heard it preached from a lost person's standpoint. I've heard it preached from a saved person's standpoint. Lost person, thanks to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, a great chasm exists between you and God. It is a divide that you cannot cross. You cannot, you cannot bridge that yourself. That's why a Messiah came. That's why the Old Testament points forward to the coming of a Messiah. The New Testament fulfills the coming of the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the deliverer. He is our salvation. He is the, he is the bridge that spans the gap between you and an almighty God. Can I tell you, if you'll give yourself to him today, he'll have compassion. He'll hug your neck. He'll love you. He'll accept you into his family. You will have the promise of eternal life, something that can't be taken away from you. You can't lose it. You can't work for it. But you will have eternal life if you'll just come to him. Verse 21 said, The son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. He actually carried out what he said he was going to do a few verses earlier. And in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Put best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand. Shoes on. My, my glasses are fogged. I'm sorry. I didn't know if I missed a line or not. I like what Harry Ironside said regarding the robe and the ring and the shoes. The robe speaks of Christ's perfection and his forgiveness. This ring tells of an undying affection. And the shoes, a slave at the end times would have went barefoot. But the son wore shoes. And so it spoke of forgiveness and the love of God and the shoes on his feet of a child of God. And we see in verses 23 and 24, the father threw a party. And the son was welcomed. Amen. He said, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. On his return, the son found clothes, he found jewelry, he found friends, a celebration, love, and assurance for the future. What changed? And like I said a while ago, instead of him demanding in verse 12 when he said, Father, give me, he said, Father, make me. And there is no distance. And I, I, I may be repeating myself, so be it. If you're away or if you're not where you once were with God, you're backslidden. If you're not in a close relationship with your father, but you claim to be a Christian, now's the time to come home. Yes. Now's the time to come home to the heavenly father. Amen. He'll have compassion on you. 
He'll run. He'll, he'll, fall on, he'll fall on your neck and he'll kiss you. You know, the fattened calf is prepared and the party is held. And notice that blood was shed. That equals the atonement for sin that you find listed in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. And fattened calves in those days were saved for special occasions like the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 23. And this wasn't just any party. It was a rare and it was a complete celebration. And had the boy been dealt with according to the law, there'd have been a funeral. There'd have been a funeral and not a celebration. I like what David wrote in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 13. He said, He hath not dealt us with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Can I tell you something that's a big, glaring, flashing, neon sign in our world today going wah, wah, wah. We've lost the ability to forgive in this country. We've lost the ability to look at a fellow brother or sister in Christ or just somebody that we live with in this world and to say, you know what? They messed up. But I'm not going to drag them through the mud forever. I'm not going to castigate them. I'm not going to, I'm going to forgive. We've lost that ability. And sadly enough, we've lost it inside many of our churches. You know why churches split, don't you? Because two people can't forgive. I mean, that's what it boils down to in so many cases. Notice the father's reaction in verse 24. He said, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The contrast between dead and alive. A lost person is spiritually dead. You have no life spiritually. But when you come to the father in salvation, you become alive. You become alive in Christ, amen. Oh, and what a life that is. When you're a saved person and you're away from him, you're lost in another way. I remember when I was a little kid, probably kindergarten age, we took a field trip to the Louisville Zoo. And somehow or another, five-year-old Tommy, or four-year-old, however old I was at the time, got separated from mom. And so here I'm wandering around this big old place called the Louisville Zoo. I remember this. And I start crying. And a, a zoo worker, somebody uh, came and, what's wrong? And I said, I'm lost. I, I can't find my mom. So they went. And my mom's never forgiven me for this, by the way. We've got to work on that one. They went and they got on the loudspeaker system and would the parent of Tommy Fellows please come to so-and-so office. My mother has never let me live that down. She's never let me live that down. She said, son, I was only like 25 feet away from you. I'm like, I'm five. I don't know this stuff. Point is, I didn't move. Her mom didn't move. I did. I got away from the grown-ups. I got away. I got away from those that were leading me, those that were guiding me and keeping the group together. You know, the last thing I want to look at here, and, and and I think it's sometimes it gets overlooked as we preach the parable of the lost son. Some, a lot of times it stops at verse 24 when you hear messages preached. But there's another son in this, and he's the elder son. And I won't spend too much time on it for sake of time. I just, I want to, uh, but I want to hit on it. In verse 25 through 32, the elder son was in the field and he came and drew nigh to the house and heard music and dancing. 
And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Yes. You know, listen, I've been, I've been a Christian for 46 years, saved when I was eight years old. As I said at the outset of this message, I've been the prodigal son. I've experienced both sides of the coin. I've seen and I've experienced, and I want you to listen close here because I'm going to get a little personal. I've seen and experienced churches full of grace and love, and I've experienced the exact opposite in the form of pettiness and jealousy and resentment of those who supposedly are walking. Anybody identify with what I'm talking about? And when I read this passage right here, we look at the elder son. The elder son finds out what's going on, and he's not real happy about it. He's coming home from working in the field there in verse 28, and he heard what was happening, and he got angry. You know, back in verse 2 of this chapter, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were angry with the message Jesus was proclaiming there. It says, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They didn't like the idea. That people from the outside their nation as well as, as outcasts and sinners in the nation were going to be a part of the kingdom. And like the older son who refused to go to the feast, when he found out what had happened, the Pharisees refused to enter the kingdom that Jesus had offered to the nation. Look in verse 29. It says, and he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Particularly that first part of that verse. And those words betrayed the fact that the older brother thought he had a relationship with his father because of his work. And he served his father not out of love, but he just served him out of a desire for a reward. And he even thought of himself as being in bondage to his father. You know what? He wasn't no different than his younger brother. He wasn't no different than a Pharisee. The elder son was full of jealousy and self-righteousness and selfishness and pride and anger. Ring a bell? The Pharisees measured sin by their outward actions and not by the inward attitudes. And the elder brother, he didn't want the younger brother to come home. He had it made. He was the top dog. Brother wanted to go, let him go. That brother embarrassed the family, squandered his inheritance, took advantage of his father. The elder brother didn't care about him. All he cared about was himself. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, we're talking about he was angry. Do you think the way he acted with regard to his anger was appropriate? No. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Anger's a normal human emotion. It's okay to get angry. It's how you deal with that anger that makes it right or wrong. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher. He said anybody can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time and for the right purpose and in the right way, that is not within everybody's power and is not easy. You know, I... I'm interested, too, in the fact that the father, in verse 31, pointed out to the older son that had the joy of being, he had the joy of being in the house all the time, and now he should rejoice with the father that his brother has come home. 
and I see a picture of this, and I can't help but think of the local church. We should rejoice any time a lost person comes to salvation in Christ. Amen. And more, more importantly, well, not more importantly, but just as importantly, when someone who's gotten away from God comes back and walks these aisles and gets themselves right with God and wants to get themselves right with the church family, we ought to fall on the neck. We ought to have compassion. We ought to love on them. But how many times have we seen, Christian, people get thinking they're more important than what they are? If somebody comes back to... Uh, joins the church or somebody comes back to God and and maybe somebody starts feeling threatened all of a sudden. You hear me? And so they try to push or keep that person at arm's length. What kind of grace is that? What kind of mercy are we showing somebody who's repenting and coming back into fellowship? When I read that, that elder son didn't want that brother to come back. He wanted, he wanted the rest of the farm and the inheritance all to himself. But the father set him straight. Yeah. Verse 31, he said, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. In other words, there's no sense in you acting like this. You're here all the time, you're with me all the time, and everything that I've got left is going to be yours. He said it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. I've been on both sides of that coin. I've experienced the love and the grace. I've experienced the arm keeping you at arm's length. Folks, we ought never be like that. We ought never be like that elder brother. Rather than being angry, he should have rejoiced that others would join in them and would be a part of that kingdom. And I said the father had the last word there in verse 32. He did. And can I tell you, the father has the last word. The father has the last word in our relationship with him. Tonight, I want to ask you, have you been a recipient of the grace of God? If you're genuinely saved, I pray that you are. Maybe you're a child of God and you've been on the run. Maybe somewhere along the line Satan planted a seed in your mind and you deviated, you got off the path and you've been away from the Father. Now's the time to come back. Now's the time to come back and give you more. The world can't give you more than what a life in Christ can give you. Maybe someone here is burdened for someone you know. Maybe a family member. Maybe a Maybe a son or a daughter, maybe a a relative. You know and you love them. They're in the same boat as this prodigal son was. And Whatever it is, I want to encourage you, burden or blessing, give it to the Lord tonight. Adrian Rogers, I love Adrian. I miss Adrian Rogers. Most of his sermons he closed out at Bellevue Baptist Church was just like this. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. If you're a prodigal, quit wasting your life. You only get one life, and it needs to be lived for your Creator. If you're away from him, come back to him. It's better to be within the family fold than it is outside of it. It's safer. It's where the love is. It's where forgiveness is. It's where encouragement is. Would you stand with me, please?